join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a customer and an advisor about swing dance lessons. You have 30 seconds to look through questions 1 to 10. Swing with us. This is Martin speaking. How may I help? Hi. I was given one of your brochures this morning, and I'm calling to inquire about the classes you're planning to start in my area. Great. What would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know a little bit about the timetables, the pricing, that sort of thing. I'm planning to take classes myself, and I know my daughter and my son are interested too. Right. Do you mind if I just take down your details first? No, not at all. My name is Jane Schmilton, spelt S-C-H-M-I-L-T-O-N. Perfect. And could I get a phone number as well? Would you like the landline or my mobile? Whatever you prefer. It's just a formality. Right. I'll give you my mobile then. It's 0780-976-2942. Thank you. And could you tell me which school you're interested in attending? Well, I live between Swiss Cottage and Finchley Road, and I see you've got two schools nearby, the Swiss Cottage one and one in Regent's Park. I think I'd prefer the second one because it's closer to my work. Right. Just to let you know, the classes in Regent's Park don't start until next month, whereas the classes in Swiss Cottage start next week. Oh, right. Not Regent's Park, then. In that case, I'd rather start as soon as possible. Swiss Cottage, then. All right. We've got two courses starting next week, one for beginners on the 14th of February and one for intermediate-level students on the 16th. Ah, I've taken some classes before, but my children never have. Could you tell me a little bit more about both? Of course. So, all our classes are continuous enrollment, meaning that we don't actually have terms or anything like that. Anyone can sign up any time they want. We do follow a program of 10 weeks for the beginner's class and 8 for the intermediate, and when that's finished, we start all over again from the beginning. We also have an advanced class, which is starting in two weeks in your area, so when you finish the intermediate course, you can move on to that if you feel ready for it. Excellent. And how often are the classes? Well, normally they're twice a week, but these courses are for busy individuals, so they're only once a week, for two hours each session. Right. That's fine. I wouldn't be able to commit to more anyway, and my children have got some after-school events this term as well, so that works out. Great. And what about the prices? Well, these differ depending on how many lessons you book. As I said, we don't run terms, so students pay by the class, but we do offer bulk discounts. Each individual lesson costs £10, but if you book the full 10 weeks for your children, you'll only need to pay £90. Or, if you prefer, you could book five weeks instead, and that will come to £45. The second time you book five weeks, however, the discount might not be available anymore, so you might have to pay for the full amount. Right. And is there a discount for the intermediate course? Yeah, it's pretty similar. So, if you book five weeks, it's the same as the beginners. But if you go for the full eight weeks, it's going to be £70. Same for the advanced class. Great. I think I'll go for that for myself then, but I'm going to go just for the five weeks on the beginner's course for my two children because I'm worried they might change their minds and I don't want to waste the money or the classes, you know. Yes, of course. Just a few more questions. Go on. Well, two questions. First of all, do I need to find my own dancing partner? Oh, no. We encourage students to bring a partner if they have one, but it's no problem if you don't. You don't need to worry about it. Having one is definitely not necessary. Phew, I tried to convince my husband once. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I understand. And what was your second question? 
Ah, yes. What about equipment? People like to dress up in 1920s style clothing when they come to class, and that's absolutely fine. In fact, it makes the lesson more fun. However, we recommend that you don't wear shoes with high heels or anything like that. In general, we recommend wearing trainers or anything that's comfortable, really. That's the most important thing. You can buy shoes at our shop as well, and we can order any pairs you like, too. Great. Nothing else, then? Just yourself and plenty of enthusiasm. Ha!、Huh. I have heaps of that. Thank you very much. So, how do I book? Well, you've got three options, really. You can either leave us a deposit over the phone, or you could pop by and do the same. Or you could go on our website and book as many weeks as you'd like. The only thing with the website is that we charge the full amount rather than deposits there. Right. I think I'll pop by after work then. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour of the grounds given by a supervisor at Lincoln Hall. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to twenty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lincoln Hall. My name is Jessica Kendall, and I'm a student here at Woodgrange College. I'm also the administrative supervisor here at Lincoln Hall. As you probably already know, most of Woodgrange College's buildings serve both as lecture halls and accommodation, and Lincoln Hall is no exception. In your welcome pack, you will have found a map of the college together with a map of Lincoln Hall. But just in case, let me quickly run you through the structure of the building. As you can see, Lincoln Hall has five floors: lower ground, ground floor, and floors one, two, and three. We're on the ground floor at the moment, and behind us is the main entrance. If you have a look at your maps, you'll find that down the hall, past the stairs on the left-hand side, there are three consecutive lecture halls. Here at Woodgrange College, we take pride in naming halls after notable alumni, which is why each of these halls has both a code name and a long name. The first hall, for example, is named after Andrew Green. A Woodgrange alum who got his PhD at the age of 24 and is now teaching at Yale in America, and the final hall, which is right across the ground floor's toilets, is named after Jessica Cage, who studied creative writing here and now works for a major UK network as a TV series creator. Sandwiched between these two halls is the only hall in the college reserved for engineering students, which is why it's commonly referred to as the engine room. If you turn to your right, you'll find a corridor which leads to two rooms: the cafe and the dining hall. There have been plans to knock down the cafe, which is the smaller of the two, and build a restaurant, but none of this has been implemented yet. Do go to the cafe and try the organic blueberry muffins. They're excellent. Moving on down the hall, you'll see there are three more rooms opposite the lecture halls. The biggest one is our fourth and final lecture hall on this floor, which was originally known as the James Brown Hall, but which was recently renamed to Sophie Brown. Next, you'll find a small study room, which can be booked in advance by residents here through the college's website. And then, right before the corridor, 
that leads to the garden area. There's a private room for all faiths and religions which is available at all times. The garden area is where most of our students like to hang out, especially around the cloisters. Please be advised that you are not allowed to drink alcohol there and that there should be no chatting or music in the garden after 10pm as eight studio rooms are located in the easternmost and northernmost sides of the garden area. You're welcome to have your lunch around the fountain, however. And now that we've finished our tour of the hall, let's take a moment to discuss some of the most frequently asked questions by new students here at Woodgrange College. You might remember from your induction yesterday that there are all sorts of options and opportunities available for you, not just to meet new people and socialise, but also to acquire practical skills which might prove useful to you later on in your careers. A vast range of societies operate within Woodgrange College, such as the Creative Arts Society, the Reading Book Club Society, and even the Knitting Society. Most of these societies are independently organised by students, but they do report to the student union and are regulated by the college. There will be a society fair later this week, and you'll have a chance to browse and sign up for the ones you'd like to join. You'll find a sign-up sheet in most tents on which you'll need to write your email address. You'll then be emailed a link which will direct you to a web page where you need to fill in your details and pay a small joining fee. The Student Union can also assist you with identifying volunteering opportunities in the area. This is especially useful to those of you in quite competitive fields such as marketing and media or those who would like to work in the public sector such as in criminal justice. We do get excellent feedback from students who have used our volunteering placement service and there are some great opportunities out there for you. Just last month, for example, we began cooperating with a local business which is looking for students in the PR sector. Another thing we do, and Lincoln Hall is particularly renowned for this, is organise and host many different socialising activities. During Welcome Week, we have a cheese and wine night in the garden, and on our first weekend of each new school year, we organise a pub crawl around campus. Every two weeks, we have language exchange meetups in the dining hall. And every three weeks, we organise a trip to a neighbouring town or a place of interest nearby, like Bath or Stonehenge, for instance. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we also have a lot of buildings on campus just a short walking distance from Lincoln Hall that you're also likely to find useful. There's the supermarket, for example, which you'll find if you follow the stone path right in front of the entrance, and near that, the cinema, which also has a cafe on the ground floor. We used to have a theatre next to it, but this has been turned into a hall for drama students, and the theatre has been rebuilt further down the street. This is also where you'll find a bank, especially useful for those of you who've come from abroad and need to open an account. We've been petitioning the college for a football field, so I'll keep you updated on the developments of that in my monthly emails. I may also ask you to get involved in future petitions, but they are by no means obligatory. Now, let's walk this way where we'll find... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students and their tutor about a presentation they are preparing. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 30.
Hello, you two. Uh, please have a seat. Thank you. Thanks. So, have you got your presentation ready for next week? Yes. We've prepared the slides and everything, and we've got the handouts with us if you'd like to have a look. Of course. I'll have a look and email my comments to you later. Meanwhile, would you like to talk me through what you've prepared? Nadia, why don't you go first? Okay. So, Ian and I decided to join two very different online communities and see how much information we could gather about the people in them and their relationships with each other. So, you joined a movie forum, right? Yeah, more specifically, one dedicated to a 1980s cult classic called Fright Night. And you, Ian? Well, I tried a few different sites before I found the right one. At first, I thought about finding another forum on the same film, just to see the different types of people the two forums would attract. But then Nadia and I decided it'd be better to find something quite different. So then I looked for a forum on metal music, but I couldn't find any recently active ones with a similarly sized community. So I went for one on jazz instead. Right. So, how many regular members were there on your forum, Nadia? From my research, I discovered there were 62 members registered to the forum, but only about 25 of those posted more than once a day, which is what Ian and I decided to define as regular members. Mine had much more regular members, more than 40 out of 75. Great. And how many moderators were there? Four that I could see on the Fright Night forum. At first, I thought there were four in mine as well, but it turned out that one of them had recently stopped being a moderator and returned to being just a member. So it was just three after all. Okay. So let's hear about the results of your research. Nadia, what kind of personal relationships did you discover amongst the members? It was quite interesting, actually. It was like a real world community with close friendships, rivalries, and even romantic relationships developing between the members. Most of the members had been visiting the forum for months, some for years, but they were very welcoming from the beginning. They made me feel right at home. And what about you, Ian? The people in my forum were a bit more reluctant when I joined, but I suppose I discovered more or less the same things as Nadia. The most amazing instance was two forum members who lived across the world from each other. One was in Norway and the other was in Chile. And the Chilean guy flew to Norway to meet the Norwegian girl and then vice versa. Not just that, but during the first trip, they started dating, and the Norwegian girl now lives with the guy in Santiago. Crikey. And what about friendships? It was a very close knit community, and they always talked of organizing a big event for everyone to fly in and meet each other, but I don't think they were serious about it. They did talk through the logistics of it quite often, though. Nadia? Well, plenty of other people had flown to meet each other in my form as well. But as Ian said, no group event had been organized. But what I did find quite fascinating, however, was that instead of a group meeting, one of the moderators of the forum had bought this purple diary, which they dubbed the Traveler. And this was snail mailed from country to country and member to member, with each member writing a few pages in it, drawing, attaching photographs, that sort of thing. In the end, this was returned to the original moderator, who scanned it into a PDF and circulated it in the forum. Very interesting indeed. Did you manage to have a look at that diary? I did, but I haven't included it in my notes due to privacy. People were sharing really intimate stuff. Fascinating. So, overall, what was your impression? I was amazed because I'd never expected that level of friendship between people who had never met in person. To fly to another country to meet someone you don't know, and for that person to host you as well, it just seems remarkable. I agree. I think it speaks volumes about how communications technology has changed the way humans interact. I mean, we've had concepts such as pen pals for a long time, but it simply cannot compare to the way the internet has transformed the way we communicate and the opportunities it's given us to meet and speak to people all over the globe. And what about the two forums? Did you notice any differences? The people were quite different, I think. Which is to be expected considering the very different forum topics we picked. But fundamentally, they were also very similar in terms of their goals. I think the only big difference we noted was that trolls were much more likely to frequent my forum rather than Ian's. He did get the occasional ones dissing the music people posted about as geeky, but there was nothing malevolent. Mine were often quite aggressive. Right. So, how do you plan to present these findings to the rest of your class? Well, we were thinking of starting with.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about disability in the workplace. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to forty. I know most of you are wondering why we need to spend an entire lesson on something as seemingly rare as accommodating a disabled employee. And the truth is that this is not what students typically expect when they begin studying towards a business degree. Nonetheless, it is pivotal to know your rights and your responsibilities as a future employer, should you find yourself in such a situation. If you want to employ a disabled person, you need to make sure you provide them with a suitable environment. And you should also be aware of the changes you would need to make in order to support an existing employee who becomes disabled whilst working at your company. So let's start with the basics, shall we? Here in the UK, we have a law called the Equality Act, which covers a variety of situations, including disabilities. What this law dictates is that you, as an employer, must make reasonable adjustments in order to make sure that your disabled member of staff can carry out their duties and responsibilities without any avoidable hindrances, and to make their job as accessible as possible. I can see a few of you scratching your heads over there at the back. Don't worry, you're not the only ones confused. Whenever I give this lecture, not just to business students like yourselves, but even to employers or people who have been business professionals for years or even decades, I always receive the same question: What does reasonable mean? Reasonable, according to the government, is divided into three different categories, starting with changing the way things are done. What that means, practically speaking, is that if you had some established practices in your company that are now creating discrimination against your disabled member of staff, then you would need to change them. Think, for example, of parking. Maybe you have a policy of allocating parking spots far away from your building's entrance in order to make space for visitors at the front. You won't need to allow every employee a parking spot closer to the building. But if your disabled member of staff is in a wheelchair, for instance, you would need to change theirs so that it was closer to the entrance of the building. Moving on to the second category, which is changing the physical features within a workspace, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But just in case, what it means is that you might have to make actual physical changes to the building, adding ramps where needed, for example, or making your doors automatic. And finally, let me describe what providing extra aids and services means. Imagine, for example, that one of your employees lost much of their hearing ability, and were forced to use hearing aids. As an employer, it would be your responsibility to provide them with a portable induction loop. Similarly, imagine that one of your employees, who previously stocked all the top shelves with documents, is now confined to a wheelchair. In this case, providing extra aids would be required. And you would also have to delegate any duties which the disabled staff member could not carry out to a different member of staff. Let's leave the law to one side for a moment. You're all business students, future business leaders, so you should already know that rules and regulations for employees are made generally, but must be applied specifically to your individual members of staff. What I mean by that is that the law is purposefully unclear. Because what's reasonable for me might not be reasonable for someone else. As such, your first action, once you've been informed that one of your employees is now disabled, should be to talk to them and ask them specifically what they, as an individual, would need to have changed in order to function as efficiently as possible in their work life. 
you'll be surprised at the requests they'll have and how simple they might be. Believe it or not, according to research, the most popular request by disabled employees is work flexibility. Thankfully, there are a host of government initiatives available to help you to accommodate disabled employees, the most notable being Access to Work, which will not only provide assistance to you, but will also help you financially, depending on the size of your business. Most medium-sized companies don't need to contribute more than 20% to the total cost above a £500 threshold. Before you implement any changes, these are the things you should take into account. Are your adjustments going to be effective? Is it going to be practical to implement them, or are they going to be extremely difficult or even impossible? What kind of costs are we talking about, and what resources do you have available to you? These are the things your actions will be judged on should your employee decide you haven't done enough and resolve to take you to court. Although, of course, providing you make the time to listen to your employee's needs, this is quite unlikely to happen. You all look like you need waking up, so let's do a quick exercise. Turn to the person next to you and decide who will be the employer and who will be the employee. And we're going to... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.